Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Medieval Reader. So today is the fourth and final part of my four-part series on Marco Polo's travels. Now this is my first time reading the travels, um, and so all of these videos are my initial thoughts and impressions of this work. Um, I will be mentioning a little bit of research that I did, um, and link below the article that I read, but for the most part, these are kind of first impressions on a work that I've been putting off for a while. And I'm really glad I read it, despite the fact that I wouldn't recommend the travels for someone who wants to get into uh, medieval texts. It's definitely not the most engaging of texts. Um, there's a lot that's also false, and as I will point out today, there's actually quite a bit of racism. It's important to point out that Christopher Columbus had in his personal library a heavily annotated edition of the travels. Um, and because some of the most outlandish things are in the chapter on India and the Indies, I think that we can conclude that Christopher Columbus was at least in part inspired to travel to India because of Marco Polo's travels. So. There's a lot here to explore further. I'm not the one to do it. My work is not on um, navigation in the Middle Ages, travels, the East, that sort of thing. And I'm sure there are a lot of scholars that have already been doing this work, and I hope to talk about them more in the coming months. Um, but I do want to do something else after this. Um, I'll get to that at the very end of the video. But on to the last part of Marco Polo's travels. So as I said, the chapter on India is the most ridiculous. Um, there are descriptions of animals and people that clearly never existed. Marco Polo never saw these kind of beings. Um, he just took it right out of um, Isidore of Seville's writings. Um, Isidore of Seville was a medieval writer um, right after the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, and he claimed a lot of different things about um, people in the world, and some of these beasts, I guess, I don't know what to call them, um, clearly didn't exist, but people in Europe believe that they exist. Some things that are pretty bizarre. Um, there are yogis uh, who live to be 150 to 200 years old, um, and they live this long by drinking quicksilver and sulfur. Um, I definitely don't recommend you drink that. Um, you will definitely not live to be 200 years old if you do. Um, but there you have it. Um, there's also descriptions of some giant griffins, which, so griffin is uh, part lion, part eagle. So it has a lion's head and eagle body. Uh, Marco Polo says in the travels that the uh, griffins in the Indies, so India and the surrounding islands, are not like the griffins that Europeans imagine, um, but they are still large birds. So large, in fact, that they can carry and throw an elephant. Marco Polo must have never seen hippos or tarantulas or bats because the way he describes them is like he's never seen them before. He describes them using descriptions from other animals. So for example, hippos are described as boars. Um, bats are mice who are hairless and they fly. And then tarantulas are just described as these really large spiders um, that are venomous. And uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about how fearsome they are. Uh, but also how tarantulas, you know, where a tarantula is placed in relation to um, a dispute that's going on is like seen as an omen, so good or bad depending on where the tarantula is. There are a few things, however, that he says that I think are pretty accurate. Um, for example, the monsoons in June, July, and August, the heavy rains, as um, he says. Um, he talks about how the left hand is considered unclean, um, and I think that's, you know, certainly um, an accurate observation. The left hand in many cultures is considered unclean, and it appears that it wasn't so in Europe because the way that the author talks about the Indians and their belief in the left hand being associated with all things unclean, evil, that wasn't a European view. In some of the islands, the Christians, there are Christians, 
but the Christians practice enchantments, um, and he then Marco Polo refrains from describing the enchantments because he says, oh, but I don't want to describe these enchantments lest I inspire people to practice these demonic arts. There was some repetition in the earlier chapters, but I saw the most repetition in this final section. There were scenes that were repeated over and over again with little to no difference. Um, and sometimes the same descriptions for people living in very different lands. Um, there's also language taken from the romances, which I think is really interesting on a literary level, but it really took me out of the story because, you know, here I am following the travels of this person and suddenly there's language from the Song of Roland and I am forget I'm reading the travels. Um, so for example, Then you might have seen the air filled with arrows, as though with rain, and many a man and many a horse mortally stricken. Then you might have heard such a clamor and a tumult that the thunder of heaven would have gone unheard then none could have doubted that they were mortal enemies. So long as their arrows lasted, those who were fit and able did not cease to shoot. For you may well imagine that many of them were dead or wounded to death, so that it was in an ill hour for both armies that that day's fighting began." So there's all this language, then you would have seen this, then you would have seen the arrows that were flying and, you know, knocking people off their horses. That kind of language exists in the epics, and particularly the Song of Roland. And indeed, in the very last chapter that describes the conflict between the Mongols, I basically forgot I was reading the travels. I was pretty convinced I was reading The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just completely a fantasy at this point. Um, and you see Kublai Khan who's fighting against his nephew. Uh, and then his nephew, I think, moves up north and um, decides to live separately from his uncle. Uh, but they're still fighting with each other. And, and then suddenly the book just ends and someone later put in an epilogue so that there would be some sort of a closure saying, okay, this is the account of Marco Polo and his father and uncle who went along with him. And there you go, it ends. Um, I was really bored, to be honest, for most of it, and also really shocked. There are very, very racist parts in these chapters. I mean, certainly the earlier chapters were racist. I mean, there was a lot of Orientalism. There was a lot of either glorifying people, you know, like there are these um, imaginary perfect people or they're like really demonic. Um, their religious practices are described as um, pagan, idolatry, that sort of thing. But in this section, I, I felt like the language that was used is very much like the language, unfortunately, we use today um, in racist discourse. So white is described as good, so the Russians, Marco Polo says, are beautiful because they are white and have blonde hair. And in contrast, he describes the indigenous people living in one of the islands um, in the Indies as dark-skinned and ugly and just really this description that you would see in um, minstrel shows and, and things like that. So it's, it's very, very racist. Um, and I think that more scholars should really do work on this uh, text and maybe other travel narratives and consider how race is being presented. Um, because I think there's a lot there. And I think it's important to consider, again, if Christopher Columbus was reading the travels, you know, this is what people are thinking about. Um, because there was actually an earlier account of a European traveling to the court of the Khan, um, and that was the travels of William of Rubric. Um, William of Rubric lived slightly earlier than Marco Polo, but he also lived in the 13th century, and his account is actually much more um, scientifically and historically accurate um, culturally accurate than Marco Polo's. But because Rustichello of Pisa was a romance writer and he was the one who wrote the travels, it was much more entertaining and so people were more likely to believe what was in the travels than what was in William of Rubric's work. William of Rubric was commissioned um, by L Louis IX, who was the King of France in the 13th century, to travel to the Khan's court um, in hopes of winning allies uh, for the Crusades, recapture the Holy Land uh, from the Muslims. So it's really fascinating how one account 
was more popular than another because of how the story was told. Which just shows how important language and storytelling are. You know, there's a reason why the History Channel is so popular. All right, even though, you know, we know that the History Channel is filled with a lot of garbage. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, let's say History Channel would be our mo modern travels, right? There's things in there that are true, and then there are things in there that are absolutely not true. And they're all mixed together, and, you know, there's some aliens, and people generally don't believe it, I think. Um, I don't know how many people believed it in the 13th century, but my impression is actually quite a few people, um, because the beasts that Marco Polo describes, as I said, existed in older writings and were widely believed. Um, at least it appears from other travels of the period. Um, so anyway, there's a lot there to consider. Um, I'm going to move on and talk about other things, um, but I'm very glad I read Marco Polo's Travels. It's a book that I can check off my medieval bucket list. So um, next week I will be making the video that I kind of mentioned last week. It's um, a Harry Potter inspired video. It won't be about Harry Potter, but you will recognize the topic of the video if you are familiar with Harry Potter. And then I wanted to read a secondary source, so I will be reading Golden Spices, The Rise of Commerce in the Middle Ages by Jean Favier. This book was published by Holmes and Meyer in 1998 and was translated from the French by Caroline Higgett. For those of you who know French, the original title is De l'or et des épices, naissance de l'homme d'affaires au Moyen-Âge. Um, this book is all about the rise of commerce in the Middle Ages and uh, the rise of the merchant class. There's, I think there's going to be stuff in here about banking, about the controversy over um, charging interest, usury, um, just all of that. And I think that this will be a good book to go along with um, the larger themes in Marco Polo's travels. Marco Polo talks about the trade in cloth, gems, spices, um, silk, you know, this kind of stuff um, will certainly be mentioned here. Um, and so there are somewhat of a long, I mean, it's like 350 pages, actually, no, wait a little long. Time. It's, yeah, it's like 350 pages. There are 19 chapters in the book. So I'm going to just, you know, see what I do next week. Um, I plan on making um, at least three videos about it um, and just kind of go at my own pace and um, read what I can and talk about some of the major things that jumped out at me. Once again, these are, you know, my thoughts, these are my initial impressions, um, but it is a secondary source. And if at any point you want to read along with me, you certainly can. Um, I don't want to ever host official read-alongs because I simply cannot commit to hosting a read-along. But if you want to read something with me, if you have primary source material you want to get through that's medieval or renaissance or even early modern, um, I prefer medieval renaissance because those are my periods, absolutely hit me up. I'm like, you know, I'm open for anything. Um, thank you everybody for watching and I will talk to you later. Bye now.